Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Rainer. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. In this episode, host Gerd Alfarth is joined by Dr. Nino Hernschul to discuss biometry tips and tricks. Professor Gerd Alfarth is one of the world's leading intraocular lens experts. He is a chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, Ruprecht Karls University of Heidelberg, and the head of the David J. Apple Center for Vision Research. Dr. Nino Hernschel is an internationally renowned expert in biometry and a surgical consultant at the Kepler University Hospital in Linz, Austria. He completed his training in Vienna at the Hanusch Hospital and has worked in many clinics across the UK and Australia. Welcome, Dr. Hernschel. And our topic, as we said, is uh, biometry. And when we talk about that, my first question would be, is there really any more a gold standard for biometry? We used to have uh, ultrasound for decades, then we had the IOL master, but now there are a lot of other machines. So what is your opinion about the topic of gold standard? Well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me, actually. And I'm really actually delighted to talk about this topic, which is basically my favorite topic, I would say. <laughs> and well, I think I completely agree when, when what you're asking is that there is not really any gold standard anymore when it comes to biometry. And what we do in our clinic nowadays, and I think that's the standard in many clinics, is that you have to compare different measurements. And also it de- very much depends on the, on, the, on the medical history of the patient. So if you have a patient where you have any corneal diseases in the past, you may want to use any kind of swept source OCT measurement. So you have a much better, much more detailed um, image of the cornea and you will have a better planning um, standard compared to, to, for example, PCI measurements, partial co- coherence interferometry measurements. And then you mentioned, for example, Scheinflug measurements. I would say that Scheinflug measurements maybe are not the, the latest uh, invention that we have because it's around for such a long time. But still, of course, it's very common, commonly used, and it also gives us a lot of information. So yes, I think there's no gold standard anymore, but I think swept source OCTs and different kind of swept source OCTs do a quite a good job at the moment, I would say. Would so, you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree to that. And when we look back, uh, uh, we actually separated the measurements in former times. We had, a, uh, for example, immersion ultrasound measurement, uh-huh. yeah, and then we used the Javal or whatever, for the keratometry. Then we had a machine like the IOL master who did everything. And nowadays we get more and more information. We even have uh, OCT technology. So we can actually also look at least at the macula, so to say, uh, even from a, from a qualitative point of view. So I think, don't you think that biometry has completely changed uh, from just a calculation or, or pr- production of data for a calculation of a lens? to a comprehensive uh, diagnostic system. Yes, I completely agree, actually, because as you just said, it used to be a number based, basically a number crunching. So you just get one number, you enter it into your formula, it was done automatically, and you just completely had to trust this one number. But now with OCT measurements, also shine proof measurements, you have actually you have a quality measurement because you see the image, you have a brightness scan or you have a shine proof image. And these kind of things really help you to see, okay, was detection properly for the entry chamber depth? Was it properly for the lens thickness, whatever? So you, I think you have a, a, this, this, this um, measurement improved quite a bit. And secondly, I think you also see that in the demands of the patients, because now it's not just cataracts, remove my cloudy lens, but it's just like, you want to be 2020 without glasses. And actually we are, yeah, well, we are much closer to this, to this aim in most of our patients, almost all of our patients than we were maybe half five years ago, maybe, or 10 years ago. Yeah, when we, when we look back 10 years ago, um, we still had some problems, maybe in like 60%, we achieved plus minus 0.5 dioptis of uh, uh, achieving target refraction. Uh, uh, nowadays, it has been approved, but it's still not 100%. Uh, so the question is for me, what is the, nowadays the impact of biometry on IOL calculation? Yeah, so in former times, a lot of people said, oh, IOL, uh, calculation depends very much on the axial length measurement. Yeah, but there are you now a couple of other things evolved and, uh, and the precision of IOL, uh, of, uh, um, of the measurement of the axial length has become much, much better uh, compared. So can you kind of, you know, 
point out which phase of the biometry or which part of the biometry now, nowadays has really lead, reached an excellent level and where we still have some, some problems that can have an impact uh, or maybe, maybe it's not the machine, maybe it's a certain group of patients. Well, I completely agree, actually, because, for example, XLI lengths used to be quite a big error, large error in the past and used to be maybe 17 percent. So that was so I can always show in his paper in 2008. And now we redid these calculations with more modern form, um, with more modern measurements. And it turns out that now it's about 2 percent of the total error of the post operative refractive surprises due to the XLI lengths measurement. So that basically means that other measurements, other sources of error are much more important nowadays. So this might be more cornea, for example, but of course the main source of error is the position of the lens or to be more precise, the prediction of the position of the lens. And I think this is where the new and more modern formulae or IR power calculation formulae come in, such as the Evo formula, the Kane formula, the Barrett formula. And it turns out that these, these formulae really give better results compared to SRKT, for example. Would you say so? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, very important to point that out, which actually leads also to my next question, because uh, nowadays, uh, um, more or less every machine offers also the IOL calculation and has the, the formulas implemented, even special formulas for post-LASIK, whatever. And uh, of course, you have to update this. So the times where you manually punched in some data in order to do a special calculation with a different program, is more or less over, uh, which I think was also one of the problems uh, that you had a miscalculation. So the question is with all these technologies, what can go wrong actually during a measurement? Uh, is this now foolproof or what would be even trivial sources of, 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 of problems that still can occur? Mm -hmm. So just, I mean, just to the first part of this question, yes, I think that there was a big issue that we had to manually type in in, in, in all our values. But now what we are coming in, actually is a small advertisement, I hope that's okay, for the ESRS, because we'll have the ESRS IELTS calculator, which will be an opportunity to also have the Kane, the Evo, the Cook 6, and all these very modern formulae all in one. So you just have to, basically use your measurements and you will have like like a summary of all the modern uh, formulae. I think this will be something which will be very, very nice to have. And everybody should use that if possible. And the second question, as so a second part of the question is not a measurement themselves. Well, the problem is always, if you, if you measure something that's not, if you don't measure it properly due to, for example, tear film problem, I think tear film problems is a really severe issue. And you can, I mean, you can just do that. You take one of your Sika patients and you just do three consecutive measurements. You will see the keratometry values will be all over the place. Okay, yeah. mean it might be okay, but if, especially when you want to have a toric lens, it will be especially the axis, the orientation of astigmatism, maybe 30, 40 degrees off. So I think it's really important to have a properly prepared patient with moisturizing eye drops, although there are some issues with that as well. Um, is it dilated? Is the pupil dilated? Is it not dilated? This has a consequence on the ACD. And there are quite some um, errors that you can actually do and always double check the measurements that you have performed, I would say. And nowadays, uh, these optical biometry devices, they always have this uh, exclamation mark and all these things. So it makes it easier than it was in the past, I would say. But you really have to do that. Still, never ever just trust the number, yeah, I would say. Mm -hmm. What do you think of measuring with two or three devices and then compare the data? Do you get more information or you get more confused? Both, I would say. So actually, <laughs> I mean, very often, I mean, I think there are different um, approaches to that. What I would really, what I really like to do is that I like to show it to the patient. So it's just basically to, to be more on the safe side to show them. You see, this is would suggest a 19 dart lens, this would suggest a 20 dart lens. And this is especially because here in Linz, we have a lot of patients who underwent any kind of cornea disease, um, surgeries and, and so on, and also refractive disease, uh, surgeries. So these patients, very often there's a fluctuation or a deviation between different formulae. And I would really like to show it to the patient. Actually, I think it would also be very important to have something like, like a figure to see if this is the deviation between different formulae. And actually, I don't have the right answer for you. It's just to prepare the patient. But to be more precise, I would say for toric lenses, for example, we are working, and I think many others do the same, that they are working on, on, on different um, algorithms on which measurement to trust and how to combine them to get better results due to combination of different measurements. Not the median or something, but just something 
uh, more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. How do you do it in your clinic? Sorry. No, we in, in, in the clinic, uh, uh, I try to use it uh, to, to, to verify measurements, especially in complicated patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in routine cataract patients, we wouldn't really go through three or four machines. Okay. But if you have a, a fun cornea, if we have a post LASIK, post RK patient, uh, uh, we repeat measurements also with different devices and, and see if this, we look for plausibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things is, is plausibility, not really uh, accuracy, but plausibility. And then you have to decide which with which value you will go. Not always is the average value of three machines the correct value. Yeah, so plausibility is important. Yeah, and also this leads to my last questions uh, about we see that the accuracy become better and better and better. And if we do everything right, if we take care of all the problems that can have, but the measurement itself has reached a higher accuracy. The question is. Is there really a limit for accuracy, so to say? Uh, especially when I think about that in the last 10 years, a couple of new lenses were developed, light adjustable IOLs that you can compensate for so-called bad biometry uh, um, and, and other things. Question is, is there really a need for these lenses anymore? If we, if we get to this high amount of accuracy, do we need intraoperative measurements? I have my feeling that we are already pretty good and uh, um, that we may actually use this only in specific uh, cases and not in general in, in everybody. Yeah, I agree, actually. I mean, it's just like, is it a very standard patient? We usually do not have a refractive surprise. No, I would say that but it also depends on what we define as a refractive surprise. I mean, I have just read recently in the 70s, for example, oh no, sorry, yes, in the, in the early 70s, a refractive surprise was more than five doubles of the target refraction in, in the UK, at least in, in the guidelines. And of course, now we are discussing, okay, is one diopter or more, more than one diopter refractive surprise or maybe half a diopter. So this is just, as I would say, what, what really makes the patient happy. And I think that there are other uh, issues that are more bothering for the patient, such as dysphotopsia, maybe remaining astigmatism. I think we're tackling that quite well, but we could still improve on, on, on these issues. But I think for spherical equivalent, we're getting much better regarding or concerning the patients who are pretty much emetropic prior to surgery. But in very short eyes, like the 19, 20 millimeter eyes, they're still mm -hmm. a challenge, at least in my hands, I have to say. Mm -hmm. But you would also agree that now the accuracy is so good that we, for example, if we take a monofocal plus lens and we want to uh, to do like a mini monovision or something like this, half a diopter difference, uh, three quarters of a diopter difference between the two eyes, that we can uh, successfully apply that yes. and not uh, have like 50-50 chance of getting there. Completely so, free, yes, agree. Yeah. 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 Okay, so great. I think we have, have covered in a, in a short time uh, quite a bit already. And I think it's a fascinating topic. And thank you very much for your for all your answers. In the next episode of Peer to Peer the podcast, Mr. Alan Barsom will be discussing the importance of surgical instruments, why they shouldn't be overlooked, and an exciting newcomer to ophthalmology that is shaking up the industry with its premium single use and recyclable instruments. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rayner does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labelling and instructions for use for Rayner products in all cases. Not all Rayner products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.